fascinates me, uh, the older I get, and it seems to be happening all the time, is the effect that small decisions that we make early in our lives or that other people make for us have on the course of our lives, in my case, over 50 years later. A decision I made to play the flute when I was seven years old based on some childish whim. And here I am, you know, 54 years later, talking to you. And you all come from such far-flung parts of the universe, uh, from some cases small towns in Iceland and in the Crimea and northern Israel and uh, Milwaukee. <laughs> and, uh, and yet somehow you all filtered down to the Met. And I think as a point of departure, it would be fascinating to know a bit about how that worked. I, I think the furthest flung of you would probably be Stefan, who comes from a small fishing village in Iceland. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about, paint the picture of what that place was like when you were growing up. Yeah, I, I, it was a very small town, um, about a thousand people. What's it called? Neskupstadr. And it's a... Uh, Everybody say that. It's a... Uh, <laughs> three times fast. Um, yeah, so, and it's basically in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And, um, but I was fortunate to, to be born into a very musical family. My father was uh, the organist in the town and... Uh, oh, he was the organist? I didn't yeah, realize that. Yeah, he was, and, and he also owned a furniture store and um, um, a record store. He sold records at the time, you know. So a great music lover. Yes, and played the piano every day and played records every day. And some of them were, yeah, his favorite recordings were of Maria Callas. Oh. And, uh, and like, did, know, did he come from this town? Yes, yeah, he was born there. I looked it up in Wikipedia. I can see <laughs> that there are 1,437 inhabitants. <laughs> it's, yeah, there's a lot of... <laughs> and it's sort of amazing to me that mm. in a town, it's essentially a fishing yeah. Processing village, right? Yes, yes. Uh, that somebody would grow up and love Maria Callas. Yeah. What, uh, how did he find his way to that? Um, his mother was a very musical person. She's, uh, <coughs> she played the organ a little bit. She sang in the, the local church choir. And um, there was just a lot of musical attendance. They, they listened to Radio Luxembourg, you know, in the, the 40s when he was growing up. Hmm. And then he became a, a jazz musician in the oh 50s boy. he played the accordion and, and the piano and um, so you know it, it's just um, some for some reason i don't know it was music was just in their family and so flute was your decision or their decision um it was kind of my decision i i played the recorder and i i um, was very good at it and i i um, have have a niece who, who used to live in the same town and she mm -hmm. played the flute and um, I actually tried a couple of instruments clarinet and trumpet didn't work out and eventually went to for a lesson with my niece and she you know gave me my first flute lesson and uh, actually I was she told me just just play the head joint for one week yeah she told me not don't don't put the you know instrument you see you playing Vivaldi concertos <laughs> by the end of that week <laughs> So I had I played the head joint for a week and then I put I was so excited to put the thing together and it made a nice noise so you know and I, now uh, so. your father you told me would drive you around the coast of Iceland something like eleven hours for your flute lessons in Reykjavik yes yeah he did I was um, uh, when I started playing um, there there was a shortage of teachers in the town mm -hmm. and in the area where I lived just. Um, they were not flute teachers. Mm. And my niece was not really, you know, um, a flute teacher, and you know she was doing other things. So um, he contacted the his his cousin in the Iceland Symphony who recommended a teacher for me, and um, I actually um, went to to play for Bernard, who was my first uh, flute teacher, Bernard mm. Wilkinson. Yeah, and. Um, and I was nine years old, and, and um, he, you know, decided, you know, if you're willing to make the effort to come every month, I'll, I'll teach you. And, mm. you know, if you're willing to stick to uh, the program that I will I'll give you. And then my father was <coughs> so dedicated, and he, he made it happen. 
It, the, it's fantastic the way that uh, <laughs> parental involvement here. I, I know that your story is rather similar to that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Actually, there are many things which are very similar. Yeah. It's, it's, it was also my father in my case. And there was also um, not a fishing village, but a fishing boat which he was working on hmm. for 10 years. And um, he had nothing to do with music whatsoever. But um, he had a friend who always listened to classical recordings. And my dad couldn't understand what was so great about it, but he saw this guy every night listening to these records between you know, the shifts of, of hard work. So then my father thought it would be a good thing for us to study classical music a little bit. Uh, because in Russia they have a system, um, anybody could go at that time. I think it's quite similar now, except that you have to pay nowadays. It, it, it used to be free. Um, you could go to a school and study for five years and then if you're good and if you want to continue you could go to a specialized school so he put my brother and i in that school mm -hmm. one of his local music schools and <clears throat> he thought at least when we grow up we could appreciate listening to classical music and understand it a little bit so mm -hmm. that's how it started <laughs> now you grew up uh, on the black sea there in the crimea uh, yeah it's uh, <coughs> my town is sort of more Inland, um, it's about 70 kilometers from from the mm -hmm. sea, but yeah. But it's a good distance from Moscow, where you ended oh, yeah. up. Oh yes, it's about a thousand miles, I think. Yeah. From Moscow. Yeah. And if I recall, your father actually brought you up to Moscow, and you lived together. Yes, for a few years, um, it was just two of us because um, in my local hometown, we started taking flute <coughs> lessons, and I progressed very quickly. So. Um, finally, we found the best teacher in town, and uh, I used to go to him every week for a couple months. And finally, he told my father, he said, well, this boy has talent. If you want him to be serious and you, you want any kind of future with the flute, you have to go to Moscow. Like, this is a dead end. So mm -hmm. I think he was a good teacher to say that, you know, yeah. because most of the teachers would just keep, keep on taking money and giving you lessons. Very right. of course, so you also live in a yeah. rather remote area, at what, up yes. near the border of Lebanon and northern Israel yeah. and uh, yeah. and I know your brother a bit and uh, I know that he's uh, very involved with your own musical education. Could you describe that a little bit and, and also tell us a little bit about where you grew up? Uh, sure, well that you mentioned my brother, he does. He has a group in Philadelphia, an, an Arabic music group mm -hmm. um, that he's uh, had and uh, they started very small time and then they develop but uh, we grew up he's a violinist we grew up in uh, Tarshiha that's the name of my town mm -hmm. uh, a very small town and um, no if you're looking for classical music not, nothing there mm. whatsoever but uh, the same thing with my parents they were they had some musical background but in uh, Middle Eastern my dad actually helped uh, start a music group in the village and um, oh. it, it really was my brother who influenced me mm -hmm. all this time. Did you grow up, uh, I mean I know that he plays ethnic Arabic music, did you grow up playing that kind of music as well? No. No. <laughs> no. I, uh, well for one thing I left uh, Israel when I was young. I, I came here when I was about 13. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other thing is, uh, <laughs> well, my brother sort of wanted me to sort of just focus on classical music. A mm -hmm. bit so you followed him to Los Angeles, is that right? Yes. We, uh, well, I picked up the flute when I was about 10, 10 and a half. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, um, uh, my brother was going to school in Los Angeles at the time. And then uh, I started with a local teacher, I think, and then I spent a half a year, and I moved to another teacher. And then uh, during that time, my, my brother saw that I was practicing and developing interests. So he said, hey, why don't you come to Los Angeles to see? And well, picking up the flute, like in the beginning was completely random as well. But then uh, after a year of playing, I went to Los Angeles, I spent the whole summer. <coughs> my brother would take me with him. Uh, to school, he would go to his classes. I would stay in the practice room <laughs> at 8 a.m. You know, wow. he would come back for lunch at 12, and then he um, 
it would leave me again in the practice room, and he would come back at six, would go for dinner. And then, depending on my luck, I would stay for another hour. Oh my goodness. But so, I was completely there as a, and then, uh, uh, you know, so that happened for, I think, two summers, where I came back, or two or three summers. And, um, he, uh, he basically gave me a direction, and uh, he told me right in the beginning, he said, well, there is this really good music school, if you, if you like to be, if you want to pursue music, this is the place to be. And I'm like, yeah, well, what is it called? And he said, oh, it's called Curtis. Curtis? Yeah. Um, it, I was 11, I think, and uh, we kept practicing. It's funny, I would go back to Israel during the year, but after school would be over, he would call the first thing. Hmm. Like, Maron, bring your flute, come on, I want to hear your your pieces, you know, like play me the Iver concerto, and you would have like some oh, of yeah. his friends. <laughs> so you, you hear about, you know, the, yeah. the tiger moms in, uh, in Chinese society, you had a tiger brother, actually. <laughs> He's a good brother. Yeah. I, I, I met him, I enjoyed talking to him. So. Stephanie, now you're, you, you come from this uh, small Native American village, uh, uh, Milwaukee, is that yes. how it's pronounced? <laughs> You took up the flute at an early age as well as everybody else? Uh, probably not as early. I think I started when I was 12. Uh -huh. So, so I, what were your formative musical influences? Um, well, when I was very young, I started at, well, with Kadai, which is the primitive percussion instruments, and then um, started playing piano when I was six. Oh. Um, so I had played... By the time I started to get more serious with flute, I'd had pro probably 10 years of piano. And then I, unfortunately, I gave that up because I didn't think I had time for both. So mm. now I'm a terrible pianist. But mm. um, yeah, I, I think it's a little different. I, my, my parents were very, uh, very supportive of the music that I did, but it was, they were not, it wasn't as much of a an effort because I think that the, the the music was available much right. much more easily in my area. Milwaukee yeah. has a great art scene. Wisconsin is known for its um, music education. Mm -hmm. So I was really lucky that way. And you know, but my parents were great. They let me use the car to go down to youth symphony, and like you know, mm -hmm. always came to my concerts and were very supportive. But it wasn't till I spent a year in Switzerland um, as a foreign exchange student, and there they have. Um, the you know they divide out the high schools earlier in terms of what your focus is and I ended up in a music class and it was at that time that I really decided that performance was for me so that was you know when I was 17 I before that I was thinking music education right and um yeah and I and and even at that point I was auditioning um I had taken up singing as well so I was auditioning at the schools that I chose on both flute and voice and was actually accepted in both so then I had to make a choice which way I was going to go. So you combine the two by joining the Met. Yeah, so it's kind of funny <laughs> that so I I'm end up with the Met. looking common denominators here. It seems like you know, you, most of you started early. You started a little bit later. You all had <coughs> parental encouragement and, uh, and at some point a great passion for what you're doing. I think, you know, I hear you guys play and, and you're all phenomenal players and I think people tend to think that, well, this is just, a, you know, your success is a product of your talent, but then you hear the story of Maron practicing for 12 hours a day, and uh, <laughs> I'm wondering, are, were the busy. others of you uh, <laughs> obsessive practicers like that? No. <laughs> no. I think, well, for me personally, it was in phases. I, I was very lazy, and my dad would have to force me to practice, you know, at some point. So you had a tiger dad. Uh, sort of. <laughs> and uh, I remember, I, and I think a lot of kids did that because uh, I have many friends who came came up with the same idea. I would record myself. Um, and my, my dad was downstairs repairing the oh car. My God. I, I, you did the same thing? No, but uh, that's, so oh, that's brilliant. I, I recorded myself <laughs> practicing for about 15 minutes. And then uh, I put on the tape and I was playing in tender. <laughs> oh. my, my dad was, and uh, once I put the volume, I think, too high, so he came back and said, like, I think your sound is getting bigger. Here <laughs> 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 are the stories of, uh, like, Lang Lang, if you've ever read 
interviews with him, there are these stories about him practicing the piano and his father coming and saying, it's not good enough, you should jump out the window. <laughs> you know, these, these, you know, this kind of very severe negative uh, impact uh, that had such a positive result. Did you have that kind of relationship with your with your father or your teachers or my teacher was uh, yes in Moscow was like yes that? he he had uh, his own way of um, teaching and he was actually the, the best teacher in Soviet Union by far uh, he was a huge star so all of the big orchestra jobs were taken by his students um, and I don't think it was because it was a mafia or anything like that <laughs> they were really uh, the well best trained. players yes. Yeah. And he was the only teacher who would teach people to play with focused sound. Other than mm -hmm. that, if you listen to Soviet recordings, a lot of flute players, they sound really unfocused and like airy. Yeah. And he had a completely different approach because he trained in France for a year with mm. Jean-Pierre Rampal. Mm. So he was like a flute god in Russia. But um, I remember my first lesson with him. I could already play Gosek tambourine and I was very proud, you know, as a nine year old. Um, and he said, you don't know anything about the flute. Okay, so uh, similar to your niece, he said, just <laughs> practice with your head joint first. And then uh, he would make me play just long notes and nothing for two months. Uh, I would not do anything with fingers at all. Mm -hmm. So I was very frustrated. And a couple months later, uh, I came for a lesson once and um, he said, you have absolutely no talent for music. And uh, I'm gonna buy you a ticket to take a train back to your hometown and you, you should never come to Moscow again. Right. And I was so, so shocked by this statement, you know, I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. So the next day I didn't go to school and I stayed home, practiced for seven hours when I was nine yeah. years old. You know, that's a very opposite <laughs> kind of way of thinking than here where people are saying you must build uh, self-esteem in your students, but, but they're I mean, I had a bit of experience with that. I know that both of you studied with William Bennett and mm -hmm. uh, that English school. And they, when I was 27, I'd been playing at the Met for several years and I decided to go off in search of different ideas mm -hmm. and refinement. And I remember I uh, discovered that Jeffrey Gilbert was, mm -hmm. uh, who had taught yeah. Wib and, and, and Jimmy, mm -hmm. he was living down in Deland, Florida. And I went down to take some lessons from him and I went down and I remember I played the uh, Chaminade concertino for him and there was a 16 year old girl before me and a 16 year old girl after me and I thought well I've come down I play first flute at the Met he'll like this you know and I played it for him and he looked at me and he said well it's not really very good is it? Taste of that, but it had the same galvanizing effect on me. I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe it isn't. And then he picked up the flute and he showed me what really good sounded like. You mm -hmm. know? And uh, there was this uh, no nonsense approach to it, which I found mm -hmm. very uh, exciting. And it set a certain standard, and that's what I had gone there for. And so, you know, I ended up uh, going back to New York and practicing my scales for six months and coming down for another mm -hmm. another session. And that. In a way, I know you. I mean, you're very motivated and very particular. And uh, did you also have a teacher who drove you in that direction, or were you more self-motivated? Um, well, definitely when I was younger. My, my mom tells me they never had to make me practice, so mm -hmm. I don't I don't actually remember them <clears throat> like forcing me in any way. But, uh, um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, really or in college, my... the. I would study with Mary Stolper and um, yeah. she was an amazing teacher and very no nonsense as well, although not quite as severe <laughs> as, as you're talking about. But um, she actually, you know, she told me one day that I was going to make it and I that really stuck with me. It was like, mm. OK, you know, if she says that, then it's got to be true. And I just set my sights on it. Um, you know, it, it, it never occurred to me, I guess because of that, that it wasn't going to happen at some point. So right. that, that's good. I, I feel fortunate. <laughs> mm. And when you were in L.A., you were teaching, you were studying seriously. Who, who was your teacher there? I had several uh, teachers. My main ones, though, uh, was David Shostak. Oh, yes, right. L.A. Chamber. Used to play in the chamber orchestra. 
and uh, who else? Sarah Andam from Adwell, that's good. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, and they were great teacher, but when I was in LA, really for me, it was just, it was my brother who kept pushing. Right. You know, I, I think that a lot of people might not realize how much failure is involved, and, mm. you know, and so, right. you know, it wasn't all a string of successes for me in right. going for, you know, starting in college, you know, it was, um, there were a lot of, you know, I didn't, I never got into a music festival that I wasn't an alternate for, you right. know, I got in as an alternate. Right. I never got into Tanglewood, you know, um, I didn't get into several of the schools I applied for, including when I, the first year I um, applied for uh, masters, I, I didn't get into the one school I applied for, which was NEC, so I had to take a year off yeah. and work. And you too? <laughs> oh, okay. And so then, so then, uh, you know, then I worked and worked and got, you know, then I took a chance again and applied for three schools, didn't get into two of them, got into NEC. Yeah. But, you know, then a string of orchestral auditions that were, you know, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. And then finally, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 It's, it's an interesting yeah. point. You know, it's like, um, I felt like that was kind of similar to my path. Also, mm -hmm. I, I um, had been doing a lot of competitions, trying to get into stuff, into orchestras. But um, as I say, <laughs> there was a lot of, there were a lot of no's. Before yeah. the before the yes came, you know, <laughs> you know similar. Well, of course, yes. Everybody has the, the same experience. I think if you ask any musician, and I think actually one um, thing when you meet people who have succeeded and got jobs, I think one thing in common is always that you keep trying and you don't give up because it takes a certain personality. Uh, a lot of people would feel so bad after failure that they cannot continue. Right. And um, that's why a lot of people quit music, I think. It, it's, it sort of hurts you when you take an audition and you, know, you get kicked out from first round and you think, I don't play that badly, why, why did that happen, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's really discouraging, um, but you just have to try everything, I you think. You have to develop and resilience yeah. and persistence and yeah. keep your eye on the ball. I know we've all had those experiences yeah. and, uh, mm -hmm. and fortunately, in the case of all of you, it didn't last too long. I think in certain cases, people get to the point where they uh, they can't tolerate that anymore. Yeah. And I can remember my first audition was, uh, I was in my third year of Juilliard, or maybe my fourth, I think I was 20. And uh, there was an audition for the principal solo flute job in the Berlin Philharmonic. Jimmy Galway had vacated that job. And I just happened to stumble across this, this uh, advertisement in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And so I just sent away my resume and I forgot all about it. You mm -hmm. know? And uh, months later, I got this call on the phone from a guy with a very strong German accent saying, the audition for the Berlin Philharmonic will be tomorrow. <laughs> See you at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> <laughs> My teacher when I went to Juilliard was Arthur Laura, who had been uh, principal flute at the Met back in mm -hmm. the 1930s. Mm -hmm. But he grew up at a time when nobody prepared excerpts. I mean, and so he didn't think that that was the way to go. I mean, you would just, uh, you know, somehow you would absorb this stuff while you were playing. And the conductors had such power in those days that they would say, put that man in that chair, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. and it was done. And when they got tired of you, he'd say, take that man out of that chair and turn around back and shoot him. <laughs> it was a very different kind of a world. And so I had not really, I had no idea what I was going to do. And, and I was back in this room like this with young flute players, about five or six of us, and we were twiddling our thumbs. And one by one, they invited us to go out on the stage of Carnegie Hall. And I went out there clutching my Mozart concerto to my chest. And I didn't know until that moment that when you audition for a German orchestra, they all show up. Yeah, the orchestra. Yeah. The orchestra yeah. shows up. And so I look out and there's the Berlin Philharmonic. <laughs> <laughs> I just made you feel. <laughs> I kept pinching myself. I think I kept thinking to myself, okay, I'm ready for this to dream to be over now. I think the nightmare has yeah. gone on long enough. And Herbert von Karajan was seated at an upright piano at the base of the stage, and he 
played sort of a bobbling introduction to the Mozart concerto, and I played what seemed like about ten notes, and then he said, thank you very much. <laughs> and that was that. That was my first audition. So, you know, you, you learn, well, I think there's probably more to this game than uh, yeah. what I've experienced so far. But uh, it's good to have those experiences early because it yeah. calibrates you. It sets your standard. You realize, you know, if I'm going to make it in this world, I really have to uh, be persistent and I really have to set my standards very high and I have to be resilient. I mean, you know, because I think we've all had those experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm.